If you want to support independent content like this show, the PlayStation Podcast Sacred Symbols, the Retro Podcast Knockback, and more, and get perks for doing so, please consider subscribing to Collins Last Stand on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Your support is essential. Thank you. A few weeks ago, an interesting report emerged that was feverishly disseminated by games media. According to a recent poll conducted by GDC, the Game Developers Conference, nearly half of all game devs polled want to unionize. Indeed, a full 47% of those polled said they'd want games industry unionization, while 16% said no outright and 26% expressed uncertainty one way or the other. Even with 11% of respondents simply not answering at all, it stands to reason that a plurality of games industry professionals, those who work on games at development studios and alongside development initiatives at publishers, want to unionize. But this raises so many questions that games media simply refuses to answer. Would unionization actually be good for the industry? Who would benefit? Who wouldn't? And would the positives outweigh the negatives? The answers are complicated and can only be garnered from parallel industries and experiences at present, but rest assured it's not as rosy as the polygons, Kotaku's, and waypoints of the the world would lead you to believe. See, when we talk about the intrinsic link between far-left politics and mainstream games coverage, this is one of those brightly blinking lights on the dashboard that deserves more attention. Because there's way more to this story than worker perpetually struggling, greedy, executive bad. It's the analysis of what essentially amounts to economic cavemen, and let's be honest, you all deserve better. Let's first lay down a perfectly honest and reasonable foundation. There's no doubt whatsoever that, at one time in history, particularly around the dawn of the Industrial Revolution right on through its nascent days, labor unions provided an essential service, a bulwark between the excesses of a new form of capitalism and a downtrodden working class only generations removed from peasantry and, depending on where you were, perhaps even outright serfdom. In the 19th century and right into the 20th century, there were significant gains made by global labor union movements that provided workers with an increasing list of rights, freedoms, and guarantees that we take for granted today. The eight-hour workday, the five-day work week, the notion of weekends, disability pay, child labor laws, and more were all partially or wholly won by the hard work of labor unions and their allies, who baked into the cake what was once only a dream, a life where you could and perhaps should work to live instead of live to work. Unionization and its many gains should be applauded for its contributions to our quality of life, the fair nature of our economy, and the expectations of workers and consumers alike. The very idea of combining workers into one single cudgel was a wise one. But the question we now have to ask, now that their hard-earned gains are part of the ingredient list for many of us, and have been for generations, is if labor unions still have a place, and if the disruption they can cause and the financial strain they can put on companies or even entire industries is worth what they continue to bring to the table. After all, when the left-leaning games media discusses unionization, they do so breathlessly, ignoring many of the downsides in order to best preserve their orthodox view of society and our economy at large. Many of these people seem to hate capitalism itself, which is so strange, since capitalism allows them to write about video games for a living, as opposed to working in a mine shaft excavating magnesium ore for a dystopian communist regime. But I digress. The point is, to understand if unionizing makes sense for game development, we need to know the whole story, not just the parts that conveniently help spin a predetermined narrative. Once you have all of the facts, you can make an informed decision on how you feel about all of this for yourself. As for me, all I know is that it's way more complicated than many vested interests are making it seem, and diving in headfirst would be a major mistake as a result. One of the biggest pieces of the puzzle is undoubtedly pay. Pro-union voices express that along with unionization comes higher pay. This is true, particularly for blue-collar workers, which game devs aren't. A report released by the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics showed from 2001 through 2011 a steady outpacing of union pay versus non-union pay in parallel fields. It also shows gains made for unionized employees across three separate verticals, civilian, private industry, and government. Unionized workers, by and large, do better than their non-unionized peers, and they typically have better benefits like medical, leave, and retirement plans. That's where the other side of the coin rears its ugly head, though, because union power and rampant overpromising means that many pension plans, both private and public, are completely insolvent, amounting to no more than a generational pyramid scheme. As Forbes notes in 2016, one massive union pension fund pays $3.46 for every $1 it takes in. While the gains made in the here and now for unionized workers are solidly above the average, unionized workers are paying dues and payments that they will never benefit from, essentially evening the field. While average union dues in the United States amount to a mere $400 a year, the pension payments being paid by a younger generation who will never reap the benefits of those payments means that many are actually being paid less than non-union workers, on top of being promised things that will never materialize. When looking towards the future, unionization is a Ponzi scheme. 
The thing about business is that it doesn't exist for altruistic reasons. Businesses exist for one reason, to make money. So in reality, while union workers do better than non-union workers, that money still needs to come from somewhere. And the reality is that the business structure of many corporations, large and small, cannot sustain the back-end costs of unionizing because many companies run on margins that are tighter than you might think. The U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics may tell us that unionized workers make more, but that same body also tells us that they cost their employer significantly more, far in excess by percentage of the cost of a non-union employee. In other words, a unionized employee doesn't just cost more by what he or she makes alone. At the end of 2014, federal statistics show that while a unionized employee makes $6.63 more per hour than a non-unionized employee, or about 24%, there are silent back-end costs, which few people see and even fewer people worry about. As this study notes, union benefit packages accounted for 40.3% of compensation costs, 11.1% higher than non-union workers. That's real money and it needs to be accounted for somewhere, whether in our case from a publisher's coffers or, more likely, from your own wallet. Positive union numbers are also heavily skewed, particularly in the U.S. The reality, when you dig through the numbers, is far more dire for the contemporary effectiveness of unions and the health of their initiatives in an ever-increasing, ever-vibrant economy. The United Auto Workers, for instance, has more than 300,000 active dues-paying members, but there's a problem. For every one active UAW member, there are two retired ones. And what if I told you that if you average in those numbers in a more appropriately mathematical fashion, you don't see a thriving union, but a slowly dying organism that is ill-equipped for the 21st century? Here's the reality for one of America's biggest unions. If you were hired after 2007 in a UAW shop, you make substantially less than workers at non-union car manufacturers also based in America. Mercedes-Benz pays an average of $65 an hour in literal compensation and benefits to its American factory employees, substantially more than the UAW pays almost anyone. No unions needed. That now brings us back to the games industry, one that's both making a lot of money and executing crazy numbers, but one that's also completely unevenly fed by massive hit machines like Fortnite, driven by uncertain microtransaction figures coming mostly from whales, inflating industrial health indicators. Late last year, Telltale Games went belly up after a string of hits didn't provide enough for long-term financial health, and the biggest canary in the coal mine with that story is that the company simply couldn't find capital, meaning there was no interest in continuing their venture because no one thought a profit could be extracted from it. Trust me when I say Telltale is far from alone. As I'm writing this, we are apparently on the precipice of a major layoff at gaming behemoth Activision Blizzard, a wildly successful publisher with massive IP in its portfolio. That a push for unionization would happen at a time when publishers and developers can't figure out how to sustain large workforces and turn a profit shows not only a tone deafness among economically illiterate games media types, but a winner-take-all mentality that refuses to acknowledge that the employer-employee relationship is a dance, and without two willing partners that complement and sustain one another, the relationship cannot survive, and ultimately those on the lower end of the economic spectrum will almost certainly lose. Ideally, we'd want everyone to win on the best possible terms, but as capitalism isn't a socialistic endeavor, those terms must be ascertained by all parties, not merely the loudest or most abrasive. One major hang-up people have is with executive compensation, or the pay that the leadership of major companies make, particularly in comparison to the average worker. And it's this hill that most people want to die on. But I'm here to caution you against succumbing to the prevailing winds. For starters, there's no doubt that executives like CEOs, CFOs, and the like make exorbitant amounts of money. But did you know that CEO pay actually peaked about two decades ago when compared to what workers make? Gains like this, even when they're minor, are ignored because they either aren't happening quickly enough or, as is likely the case, acknowledging this reverse trend politically hurts the end goal. Executives don't pay themselves. In publicly traded companies like Activision, the company's board, as directed by its shareholders, pays what it feels are appropriate rates for those people. And as those of you who follow business closely know, the environment for high-paid executives in and out of the Fortune 500 is incredibly competitive. These guys aren't walking into bank vaults and leaving with whatever they want. These men and women have strict contracts that are often mostly or entirely based around meeting incentives, and suffice it to say, they've demonstrated their value on the market elsewhere. Who the hell would pay someone that much money for no reason? The answer is literally no one, and that's why economic illiteracy is a play on gaming that needs to be lifted. If you invested $10,000 into Activision shares, you would want a return on that investment. And you would want the most talented people leading that charge, and that costs money. It may seem insane anyone would make $10 million a year until you realize there's a competitor that values this person's skills so much that he has permission from his board and shareholders to offer him or her $12 million. Put succinctly, if you owned a business that grosses, say, $500 million annually, and you think you could push that number to $550 million by hiring a very talented person for $10 million a year that excels in a specific area, thus extracting $40 million in extra profit for the shareholders that funded the company, 
wouldn't you do that? The answer every day in the corporate world is a resounding yes. It's certainly worth talking about if these people make too much money for what they do, but the entire system is voluntary. You may hate that Bobby Kotick at Activision makes absurd amounts of money, but he didn't walk into a boardroom brandishing a gun and demand it. And him getting paid $5 million less a year isn't going to save very many jobs at Activision, at least not permanently, and certainly not in any extreme way. I'll gladly make the argument that people running multi-million, multi-billion, and even trillion dollar enterprises have skills, confidence, work ethic, education, and drive that very few of us, including me, have. You wouldn't have the first clue what to do as the head of Activision, and neither would I. In charge of thousands of employees, responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars in projects, everyone looking to you for major seismic decisions on a constant basis, with the board and shareholders breathing down your neck because, believe it or not, it's their money that sustains the company. It's unimaginable. But on the other end of the spectrum, I wouldn't know how to contribute to the creation of a video game, and I suppose that's the point, isn't it? The market dictates that you're paid equivalent to the value of your labor. If you want to make Bobby Kotick money, you can either go and demand it somehow, or you can do what Bobby Kotick did. Work really hard, learn, dedicate yourself, and put yourself in a position to become a millionaire. No one has you in chains. Game developers right now, as is, make nearly $60,000 a year on average, according to ZipRecruiter. And frankly, from what I know from my game dev and publisher friends, particularly in California, that's skewing quite low. But if you're making $60,000 a year as an individual in the United States, you make nearly twice the median per capita income. In fact, making $60,000 a year means you make about what an average American household with two full-time working adults makes. And as CNBC points out, a $60,000 salary means you make above the average salary of any age or gender grouping in existence. In other words, and with all due respect to my industry friends, we're not talking about a down-and-out group. We're talking about an educated, highly skilled group of people already making more than most people in the U.S. make, and their skills are transferable between industries, too. Do they work long hours? Sure, so do I. You probably do, too. And those long hours can pay off. Game websites eagerly reported on Rockstar's purported 100-hour work weeks that didn't actually happen, but they don't seem eager to report that in 2017, Take-Two, the owner of Rockstar and 2K Games, paid out nearly $400 million to its employees in bonuses the year before Red Dead Redemption 2 lit up the industry. Imagine how much they'll be doling out for that. Makes you wonder if those long weeks are actually worth something, even if they're not of the 100-hour variety. The point of this video isn't to change your mind or make decisions for you. Rather, I simply want to give you a new way of looking at things, so you can take into account not only monies paid, but skill exhibited, or risk taken, or the actual value of a person or product on the free market. Companies aren't these amorphous creations with no individuals helming them. In fact, if you have a 401k or other retirement account, you're literally invested in some of these companies and you're invested in them having positive financial outcomes. While this video didn't touch on other issues that are pertinent to the topic at hand, how unionization will likely contribute to higher game prices, that game devs could expect more layoffs if internal corporate costs go up, that unionizing across countries is almost impossible, and more, the situation will only become more complex as we move forward. The reality is the games industry isn't going to become unionized, and all you have to do is to look at Silicon Valley with its vibrant economy, extremely high pay, unparalleled innovation, and high production as an example why. That backbone of the American and global economy, as it turns out, is completely devoid of unionization. The question is, why would video games be any different? But to continue productive, spirited, and academic debate, I hope this video helped illuminate some issues that you should keep in mind as you engage with this topic in the months and years to come.